Hello, my name is Fred Kusumoto. We're going to talk about the new bradycardia and conduction disorder guidelines that were just released last week and now are going to be introduced to the clinical community at this year's scientific sessions for the American Heart Association. These guidelines are very, very important. Previously, we had had guidelines that spoke about technology, and really now we're talking about patient-centered guidelines, where we're really focusing on patient conditions. Instead of talking about pacemakers and defibrillators for patients who have bradycardia or slow heart rates or tachycardia, fast heart rates, last year, Sana al Khatib, under the auspices of the American Heart Association, the ACC, and Heart Rhythm Society, released the ventricular arrhythmia guidelines. And this year, we're talking about the bradycardia guidelines, those patients with bradycardia or conduction disorders. Joining me are two colleagues who are on the writing committee. Hi, I'm Kristen Patton from the University of Washington in Seattle. Hi, I'm Jose Hoglar from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. Again, to emphasize the importance of these guidelines, really talking about the patient with bradycardia, and instead of just talking about pacemakers only, really starting from A to Z, talking about the initial management of these patients, then talking about the diagnostic evaluation of patients, talking about then the acute therapy and the acute management of patients who present to the emergency room with bradycardia. In addition, talking then about permanent pacemakers, and finally, use of these technologies in patients with other conditions, patients who've just undergone surgery, or those patients who have perhaps other conditions, perhaps a myocardial infarction or congenital heart disease. So first, Chris, let me point to you. How have these guidelines, how do you think these guidelines are going to impact your care, your day-to-day -day care of your patients? I think these guidelines are gonna be an incredibly important resource for patient, patient care. Uh, for example, as you mentioned, when patients come to the emergency room, we often don't know what to do with them when they have slow heart rates or conduction disorders. And the writing group spent a lot of time reviewing the evidence, some of which is quite old, um, to develop their recommendations. Yeah, absolutely. When you think about it, the American Heart Association has had their bradycardia sort of uh, recommendations for those patients and ACLS, but really this document talks and fills that in and provides some more detail when uh, our patients present with bradycardia. I think one of the things that was so interesting to me about working on this document was really finding out that we have been transitioning in our care of patients away from thinking about them with respect to just algorithmic care. Although we like that in guidelines because it makes it yes. easier for us to take care of patients, in some respects, we found that there were some conditions where we could back off a little bit. Um, for example, in patients who have sinus bradycardia, we know that the overall long-term outcome in those patients is actually quite good. So for example, uh, putting a pacemaker in every patient who has a three-second pause from, science, from sin sinus bradycardia is probably not warranted. So we can really uh, evaluate the patient and take some time to figure out clinically what's the best thing for them to do, and these guidelines support that. Absolutely, and Jose, how about from your perspective, and perhaps if you could focus on sort of the management, sort of when the patient comes to you with bradycardia or you're worried about bradycardia. So Fred, like you said, the guidelines are quite new. One thing, let me back off a little bit, I like is the structure of the guideline itself, which is uh, not only is patient-centered, as opposed to therapy or device center, but also the format of the new guidelines, the chunk modular format of the new guidelines is more appealing for the busy clinician, be able to pull this information at the point of care, at the bedside of the patient. It can be an electronic device, an iPad, an iPhone, and get the information that is necessary for that clinician to take care of the patient at that point in time, next to the patient, the point of care. So in that sense, I love the new format of these new guidelines. That's very important. Uh, in terms of the, what you mentioned, in terms of the way we treat these patients now, this guideline also provides guidance from the beginning to the end when the patient presents, how to evaluate symptoms, how to make a diagnosis, and subsequently how to apply whatever intervention. So in that sense, it's also very important. So, Jose, you bring up a really important point. I think that these guidelines, you know, they've really become these huge documents uh, in the past that are 200, 300, 400 pages that, you know, the busy clinician really can't get at. And now the design by the American Heart Association and the ACC is really to develop guidelines that can be applicable at the patient's bedside. But does that really mean then that since they're smaller, uh, are they as comprehensive? How do they look at the data? Chris, you really looked at uh, some of the data. How did you talk about the process of how guideline recommendations were then formatted and developed? Well, 
This guideline is very comprehensive, and I think that people will not feel that it's too short. But as Jose mentioned, it'll be easily searchable. There are different areas of the document where the different recommendations for different conditions are clustered um, with the uh, modular knowledge chunk format to explain why it is that the writing group chose to suggest that recommendation. When we were going through each section of the document with respect to the management from the initial presentation of the patient through the, in, the course of their care, uh, we did a lot of literature searching. Um, and you will see the results of that literature searching in our evidence tables. And it was really the evidence tables that we examined as a group um, to really determine what we thought was best, what, what we thought best served the patient. Right, so even though the recommendations were short and there's a small knowledge chunk talking about those recommendations, they're really backed up by a lot of evidence which is completely transparent with these large evidence tables. That's exactly right. The beauty of the process, uh, the reason it takes a lot of time is for the writing committee to review this evidence to make sure that this is, these recommendations are based on deep knowledge of the evidence, deep analysis of what is out there and not based on, on personal biases or recommendations of the physician's perceived preferences. We have to move away from that and do a data-driven approach to make sure the patients are served better. And to dovetail with that, Jose, you know, you are really important in terms of developing our shared decision making and thinking about how do we include patients in decision making uh, in pa when they have bradycardia. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, and one emphasis the task force uh, on guideline development, the ACCHA task force on guideline development has been doing is over the years have been making sure that the whatever decisions we make are really, like you say, it's a patient-centered approach, so we have included sections in the document itself that are also recommend how to approach the decision-making process involving the personal choices and the goals of care of the patient itself as opposed to the clinician just imposing the, the personal beliefs or even the data that is out there. So it has to be a joint decision-making between patient and clinician as opposed to a one-sided decision-making. So that's very important. Also, we had, uh, as part of the, the guidance development also, we included a patient representative during the process to make sure that the process is, is perceived to be useful, fair, and comprehensive as far as the patient sees it. Outstanding, outstanding. You know, Chris, you talked about sinus node dysfunction. You know, one of the new recommendations of this document is really talking about the use of physiologic ventricular activation. Explain a little bit about what uh, the document says and what the recommendation came up with. So I think this goes back a little bit to this idea that there's some flexibility in this document that we haven't seen in very many other previous guideline documents. Um, the recommendation of physiologic pacing uh, was something that the writing group really struggled with because we are early in our field with deciding whether this is really who, who the best um, patients are to have this therapy, but we also didn't want to publish a document that was going to be outdated within the next one or two years. So you'll find when you look at that recommendation, when patients are going to have a lot of right ventricular pacing, which can be deleterious to some patients, that there is the option for the clinician to consider either conventional biventricular pacing or other forms of physiologic pacing, such as uh, his bundle pacing. I think that that's one of the important things that you bring up is that individual nuanced care is critical because the guidelines really aren't meant to be algorithmic, that really you should do this X, Y, and Z because as we know, our patients often don't fit really what uh, uh, you know, the evidence base suggested with regards to the guideline recommendations. Exactly. And one of the other areas that's similarly nuanced is those patients who have an indication for pacing therapy, but may also require consideration of whether there's also an indication for a defibrillator. Um, for example, patients who have cardiac sarcoidosis or some patients who have neuromuscular disorders. And we were careful uh, in writing those recommendations that we were able to afford the patient and the clinician the ability to consider these aspects of, of their care. Well, I want to thank all of you for watching this, uh, and I hope that you'll take the opportunity to look at the guidelines themselves. I think that they're very valuable. They think uh, that they really provide you with a way to take care of your patients really at the bedside in a very usable manner. So thank you very much. <laughs>